As my channel slowly morphs into a James Bond exclusive YouTube channel that is not happening, but it does seem like it is happening, I have decided now that I have seen No Time to Die for a couple of times now to rank all 25 official James Bond films. This is going to be my official ranking of all 25 from Dr. No to No Time to Die. From worst to best, this is my list, so I know that you guys probably will not agree with every placement of every movie on this list. You have your own opinions, I have my opinion. That's the beauty of lists, but there's so many there's so many great Bond films, there's so many mid-tier Bond films, and then there's a few where it's just like, you probably shouldn't have made that. It's, uh, yeah, we're looking at a couple here, and those couple are going to start off the list. From Sean Connery to George Lazenby to Roger Moore to Timothy Dalton to Pierce Brosnan to Daniel Craig and his final run as James Bond. And whoever comes next, I'll probably do one of these again with whoever comes next as Bond and rank Bond 26. But from those six actors, we are going to rank all 25 Bond films. You guys are in for a treat. Let's get started with the list. Diamonds are forever. Diamonds Are Forever is the epitome of bad Bond films, with virtually no redeeming qualities about it. It's not even so bad it's good. It's so bad, it's bad. And with Sean Connery back in the fold after stepping down from the role before the previous film came out, that's not a good thing. Yes, I love Connery in the role, and it's a welcome sight to see him back, but spending a good chunk of the film's $7 million budget just wooing him back after he was not on speaking terms with the producers during the production of You Only Live Twice reeks of desperation. This movie was also a huge missed opportunity to be a direct sequel to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Instead of Bond seeking revenge on Blofeld for killing Tracy and Irma Bunt for killing Tracy, we are forced to have to follow Bond on a diamond smuggling operation in which Blofeld is a part of, therefore making him the main antagonist, but Blofeld has... clones? of himself... And his whole plan is one of the more outrageous Bond villain schemes that to me doesn't make much sense. Blofeld is smuggling diamonds to build a super-powered laser satellite that he will then use to destroy Washington, D.C. and extort nuclear supremacy out of the world. Um, what? Is this Batman and Robin? Is Blofeld Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze or something? Even for Blofeld standards, that's just... Ridiculous. We also have Mr. Kid and Mr. Wind, Blofeld's henchmen who attempt to incinerate Bond alive in the Inferno at a funeral home, Bond impersonating Willard White, Bambi and Thumper, and the worst Bond girl of them all, yes, worse than Christmas Jones, or Jinx, Tiffany Case. If you're going to hide an object that Blofeld is after, maybe don't make the hiding spot so obvious. Ugh. Yeah, let's just move on from this movie. Welcome to hell, Blofeld. I'm gonna wake up, yes. On many lists, Die Another Day would be smack dab right at the bottom, and yes, this is a bad movie. Really bad. But honestly, it's entertaining. In all the ways Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson didn't in intend. Unlike Diamonds Are Forever, Die Another Day manages to be one of those so bad it's good movies. The plot is absurd. The action is over the top. And the special effects have now shifted from practical to computer generated. This entire movie has lost its mind. I won't lie. I always enjoy myself watching Die Another Day. And that's because I enjoy laughing at most of it. Invisible cars, more space weapons, lasers, more diamonds, more than obvious product placement, expensive acne, discount Emperor and Palpatine, and facial reconstruction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens in this movie. This movie thought it was the movie Face Off. The villain is so absurd, but you cannot help but laugh at the stupidity of the idea and the fact that they actually did it. The main villain, Gustav Graves, is actually a North Korean terrorist named Colonel Moon who has undergone numerous 
facial reconstruction surgeries to model himself after Bond and his hatred for Bond and create a fake identity under the name Gustav Graves and create a space weapon named Icarus that will melt the polar ice caps and create a highway between the 38th parallel so that North Korean troops can invade South Korea and start a war. Did that just sound as stupid to you as it did coming out of my mouth and me saying it? Oh yeah, Halle Berry is awful in this movie, and for some weird-ass reason, Michael Madsen is even in this movie. When it comes to the actual title song of this movie, yeah, we can forget that ever happened. Great. Now I've just induced another form of torture. Madonna. My ears hurt. You see, Mr. Bond, you can't kill my dreams. But my dreams can kill you. On Her Majesty's Secret Service has definitely gained a better reputation in recent years, has been hailed by many as one of the best Bond films, and is considered the most faithful adaptation of any of Ian Fleming's novels. Sorry guys, I'm not really buying it. This movie feels like the bastard child of the Bond series, and that is because George Lazenby only starred in one movie as Bond and it was this one. Aside from the final moments of the film, where he is actually really good in expressing Bond's agony over his wife's death, Lazenby is wooden in the role. His outfits? Look, is this a historical drama about Scotland or is this a Bond film? The relationship between Bond and Blofeld, who once again is the main antagonist, makes no sense whatsoever. Even though Bond and Blofeld finally met face to face and you only live twice, this movie treats their relationship as if it never happened. There are a few reasons for this. For one, it was the first time they met in the novels. Second, well, apparently because Bond was impersonating Sir Hilary Bray and Lazenby had his voice dubbed over by the actor who plays Bray in the scenes where Bond impersonates him, Blofeld doesn't immediately recognize him. That's the excuse the film makes, but it's too obvious that the reason this happened is because both the actors for Bond and Blofeld changed and they wanted to trick the audience. Yeah, nice job, guys. It didn't work. The love story between Bond and Tracy is one of the most forced romances in cinema history. I buy this less than the Bond Madeline Swan romance in Spectre. Sure, Tracy is magnificently played by the late great Diana Rigg, but for the first 45 minutes to first hour or so, Tracy is visibly repulsed by Bond and clearly wants nothing to do with him. The only reason this romance happens is because Bond is quote unquote forced into it by Tracy's father Draco. It's not even Bond's decision to begin this relationship, nor is it Tracy's. This is something I picked up on the last time I watched the series through, and now it's something I will never forget and makes the film and its tragic ending a little less impactful. The film also tries to show Bond and Tracy falling in love through time by use of a love montage. I'm sorry, but this is a James Bond movie. Not Bridget Jones's diary! The attack on Piz Gloria at the end is definitely a highlight, and the actual plot following Blofeld attempting to contaminate the world's food supply is somewhat pretty solid, but other than those elements and the tragic ending, which again, now feel less impactful than it once did, render this a miss for me. This never happened to the other fella. Now hear me out, Moonraker is a solid Bond film. For the first two thirds! The last act is just bananas and should never happen in a Bond film. The 1970s and the majority of the 80s era of Bond belonged to Roger Moore and his Bond films were more campy. Which, to be honest with you, I actually have no problem with his Bond films taking on a more campy and silly tone and going over the top at certain points. However, the moment I'm not okay with how far the series pushes the envelope, especially in a Roger Moore Bond film and where it takes it way too far, is when Bond breaks orbit and goes to outer space. Yep, that happens in this movie. They did it before Fast and Furious. 
and the film legitimately transforms from a Bond film into a Star Wars film, complete with a space battle and a space station that looks like the main deck of a Star Destroyer. Everything that was good or solid about the film just comes crumbling down in the final act of the film. To add on to the ridiculous space battles, Jaws, a returning henchman from the previous film, a force that is not meant to be reckoned with, since he has metal teeth and those teeth are deadly, suddenly becomes a good guy because he falls in love. And then his character is further ruined when he and Dolly drink champagne and Jaws speaks for the first time in his two movies before he meets his demise. Well, here's two eyes. Okay, this entire Jaws subplot where he falls in love with Dolly and becomes a good guy was not a good idea to begin with. Even in the first half of the film, and one dumb decision with Jaws just becomes multiple dumb decisions with Jaws. I hate it. I don't like it. This movie also feels really lazy in terms of the writing. The plot is the exact same as The Spy Who Loved Me, the difference being that instead of the villain creating a superior human race underwater, Hugo Drax attempts to do the same thing but in space. It's always bothered me and that reveal and the final act of this movie dragged this movie into near obliteration. Somebody put it near the sun and let it blow up. It makes me retroactively not like the entire movie as a whole, even if the first two thirds are somewhat solid. One of the only good things to come out of this was the bonus Aztec level in GoldenEye 64 with the Moonraker laser having unlimited ammo. Trust me, that shit's fun as hell. And sadly, bonus video game levels and boat chases galore there's a lot of them in this movie. Cannot prevent the fate of this Bond movie. Play it again, son. Tomorrow Never Dies has never been a favorite of mine. Even when I was a little kid, I didn't even like it all that much. It's less and less interesting on rewatch, which is a damn shame since this movie still has relevancy today when you take into account news, media, media moguls, the right to publish without being held liable, what media moguls will do to get a headline. Yes, all that shines through in the movie. And the movie does a fantastic job at showing us how desperate media conglomerates are, since this movie probably has the most eccentric Bond villain of them all in Elliot Carver, who is bad right from the get-go. Another strength this movie has. The plot isn't outrageous and is believable, especially in today's day and age and the previous presidency. But when a major majority of this movie and its plot involves a character who legitimately is never seen on screen for more than five seconds, and the entire scheme of Carver's plan is given away within minutes after the opening titles, which has one of the most boring Bond songs, by the way. It leaves no wee leeway for Bond or the audience to do any investigative work into the story or the characters, effectively making this movie feel tired and downright boring. There's no sense of mystery. Every Bond film up to this point has Bond investigating a lead, which leads him to a clue, which leads him to another clue, and another clue, and so on and so forth. This movie just lays everything out on the line within the opening minutes. I'm not asking for Bond to be Sherlock Holmes or something, but man, if that's all you got for the plot, that's a problem. If Die Another Day was a completely different movie and actually good, Tomorrow Never Dies would be in the running for the worst Bond film starring Pierce Brosnan. The movie moves a bit too fast since it feels like almost every other minute of the 119 minute runtime is action scenes and it's action scenes galore. Sure, they are some of the more memorable and glamorous Bond action scenes, but perhaps they should have spent more time focusing on characters like Paris Carver, Stamper, Gupta, and General Chang, that little weasel who's a part of the plot, but once again he contributes nothing! Wei Lin is solid, and Brosnan does his best as Bond in this, but in the end, Tomorrow Never Dies will always be more boring than it is exciting for me. You forgot the first rule of mass media, Elliot. Give the people what they want!
saying Quantum is a better movie than Tomorrow Never Dies may be considered a crime against humanity, but in all honesty, as boring as both films are, I'd rather watch Vengeful Bond over Boring Bond. Quantum of Solace is a really strange Bond film. This was the first time the series attempted a direct sequel. Boy, did that go south quicker than Bond and Camille falling out of a plane and landing in a sinkhole. And while the critic reviews were mixed and fan reception has been tepid, within recent years, Quantum of Solace has seen reappraisal from fans, not critics, of the series as one of Daniel Craig's best films. A lot of fans think this is better than Craig's fourth Bond film, Spectre. I'm here to say that you're all on acid. Quantum's painful editing alone makes this worse than Spectre. This movie is all action and no plot. There was a solid excuse for sure, since production started without a complete script and during production there was a writer strike and Daniel Craig and the director Mark Forrester were literally forced to write scenes themselves to get the movie done since they legally couldn't hire outside writers. But seriously? You couldn't have just pushed this release date back to, I don't know, 2009? Because of this, the movie is a rush product. Other than the editing, the plot is non-existent. Dominic Green is the worst Bond villain, Medrano feels like an afterthought, Elvis is the worst Bond henchman, Beam is a waste of David Harbour, the action scenes with the exception of the boat chase are really boring, the villain's hideout is a hotel in the middle of a desert, characters are just backstabbing each other, and I'm thoroughly convinced there's more backstabbing in this movie than there is in the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I mean, Come on, guys, you've gone over your allotted amount of backstabbing. The plot leads you to believe it's about controlling oil, but it's really about controlling a country's water supply to create a fake drought in exchange for helping General Medrano stage a coup within the Bolivian government. There's also mention about a terrorist organization named Quantum and Green's Tierra Project, both of which are never explained. Like, ever. At all. There are so many moving parts to this so-called plot that nothing is ever fleshed out since this is the shortest Bond film to date, and their idea of filling in the holes in the script was to come up with numerous action scenes that don't feel extravagant at all. Seriously? Nine major action set pieces. That's a lot for a short movie. That's not to say this movie doesn't have merit. Daniel Craig pushes himself harder than ever and still proves himself worthy of the role. Olga Kurilenko is solid in the movie and Camille Montez is a fleshed out Bond girl and one of the better Bond girls. The opera scene in Austria? I'm gonna say it guys, chef's kiss. Other than that, I can't get behind the reappraisal many have for this film. It's still a boring mess and very disappointing. This is a film that started in my top 10 but has slowly made its way further and further down the list. But at least they tried to create a solid product with all the obstacles they had against them and it has the benefit of being part of a larger story involving Craig's Bond, which is why it takes the cake over Tomorrow Never Dies. Can I offer an opinion? I really think you people should find a better place to meet. Say live and let die. Live and Let Die slowly made its way up my list, once residing in the bottom three and then making its way to the bottom five, and now sitting comfortably in the bottom ten is quite the accomplishment. Well done, movie. You get better a replay value. Live and Let Die has a fantastic opening theme song. Yafet Koto as the villain focuses on something other than a megalomaniac villain who wants world domination. Roger Moore in a more serious portrayal of Bond compared to some of his other Bond films, and the film is a product of its time, all strengths of the movie, but the plot is literally the only one of the Bond movie plots that feels as if it's super convoluted and hard to follow. Sure, the plot of the movie focuses on Kanango wanting to create a monopoly from supplying drugs and putting other drug barons out of business, but he disguises himself as the leader of a Caribbean island named Mr. Big where his opium poppies are grown and this is all drowned out in a series of voodoo rituals that make me lose sense of the actual story cuz... Oh yeah, Bond is investigating the deaths of three British agents, I totally forgot about that. No, seriously, I did. Live and Let Die revels in honoring the era of 1970s black exploitation films and acknowledging the supernatural in a Bond film, so I applaud it for being so out there and weird and different. We can't forget about Bond throwing Baron Samity into a coffin full of snakes. Live and Let Die's got major Temple of Doom vibes, and I'm all for that. 
but voodoo rituals make me lose track of the story that is being told, which brings it down for me. Although it has more redeeming qualities the more I watch it. Years ago, I probably couldn't think of this many positive things to say about it. It's still a middling Bond adventure for me, though. Quite revealing. For Your Eyes Only gets a lot of points from me for taking the series back to a more natural, realistic approach after how ridiculous and fantastical Moonraker got. Themes of revenge and its consequences run throughout the film's narrative, and Roger Moore is able to show a more vulnerable side to Bond, similar to what he did in Live and Let Die and The Spy Who Loved Me. It's a side to Moore's Bond we don't see that much. I also love this movie's bait and switch with the villains. For half the movie, you're led to believe that Columbo is the villain, when in reality, it is actually Christados who has been playing them all along. The action scenes are fun to watch, I love the skiing sequence, and the film's musical score in these scenes is definitely indicative of 80s movies. As Bill Conti provided the score, the man known for providing such scores for movies like Rocky. However, the moment for your eyes only ends it is instantly forgettable, which is why it is so far down on this list. I can't remember a single thing about the plot of this movie once the credits hit. I remember specific scenes and events that happened. The ski chase, Bond climbing up the mountain to St. Cyril's monastery, the car chase, Bond and Melina getting dragged through the reef by Cristados as they are tied to his yacht. But other than Bond's mission to retrieve the ATAC, I could not tell you why he is after it or what it does the moment this movie ends. The movie isn't complicated or anything, nor is it hard to follow. I completely understand that it's used to coordinate the Royal Navy's Polaris submarine fleet, but ask me two minutes after the movie what that thing does, and I will have no recollection whatsoever. Roger Moore is getting a little, uh, round in the tooth to play Bond, and it shows in this film. Young women still love him though, since BB wants to. Oh, oh yeah, let's forget an 18 year old is interested in Bond. Who in this movie looks like he could have been her great, 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 great grandfather. Love a drive in the country, don't you? <laughs> Octopussy has the reputation of being the Bond film with one of the worst titles. It's not just one of the worst titles for a Bond film. It's one of the worst titles in the history of film. Regardless, Octopussy may find its way down a lot further on fans' lists, and I honestly can't understand why. Its placement on this list is probably at an all-time high on fans' lists. You see what I did there? While it's not amazing and I like 15 Bond films more than Octopussy, this is still a fun watch even if it has a lot of problems. This had the daunting task of going up against another Bond film, yet an unofficial Bond film, Never Say Never Again, a movie I will never find myself talking about never again and the one that brought an older Sean Connery back into the role unofficially, and luckily, Octopussy won out. I've always loved the film's henchmen in this film. The knife-throwing twins Mishka and Grishka, as well as Gobinda, Kamal Khan's right-hand man, some of my favorite henchmen in the entire series. The highlight of the film, however, belongs to the incredibly over-the-top performance of Steven Burkhoff as General Orlov. Discount Woody Harrelson over here adds so much oomph and energy to this movie that if you omit General Orlov completely from this film, it would, one, not be the same, and two, would not be as fun or entertaining as it is. He somehow gives this movie life? Even if he just ends up playing a power-crazed army general who wants to invade Western Europe and seize complete Soviet control? The actual plot is in a way smart, since it uses a jewel smuggling ring and a circus to cover this up and Orlov's plan to eventually blow up a nuclear warhead at a US Air Force base in Germany in order to achieve disarmament so he can invade Western Europe as a smart ruse, but honestly the two plots meshing together might actually be my biggest problem with this movie other than bringing back Maude Adams again to play a different Bond girl than the one she played in The Man with the Golden Gun. The movie has always seemed like it wanted to go in the direction of a jewelry smuggling scheme that may have bigger implications and in the investigation of a Fabergé egg. 
but this all ties into Orlov's plan to invade Western Europe and not enough time is given to focus on Orlov's plan. Maude Adams' return to the franchise is a distracting sight and the humor can be a bit too, let's just say, clown-like at times. But for all the flack this movie gets for its title, its cheesy yet catchy theme tune, and Bond dressing up as a clown, Octopussy isn't terrible and still creates a lot of entertainment for longtime fans. Entertainment that is still an all-time high. Now? We have reached the entry that many deem the worst or one of the worst Bond films and for me that reputation is somehow not earned? Is A View to a Kill really good? Eh, not really, but it's not terrible either. The first half for sure is definitely a lot stronger than the second half. There's a lot of cringe moments once Bond gets to America and meets Stacey Sutton, rest in peace Tanya Roberts, and there's a fire truck chase that feels like it belongs in any 1980s cop thriller or action movie like Lethal Weapon or Die Hard, which is what I think their way of trying to Americanize Bond was, and I just gotta say, Good job, guys. You didn't nail it. I love Christopher Walken as Max Zorin, though, and his small backstory of being an ex-KGB agent and being scolded by Gogol. Is this necessary of what the Bond series needed at this time? Probably not. And should they have moved on from Roger Moore? Well, duh. The dude was 58 when the movie came out. That's far too old to be playing Bond. Even Roger Moore thought he did one Bond film too many and hated the film as well, saying it got a little too ultra-violent in parts and didn't take itself too seriously. Hate to break it to you, Roger, but other than a few Bond films, which one of your Bond films actually took themselves seriously? But that, in a way, is the charm of A View to a Kill. It revels in its boisterous over-the-topness that a lot of what made Roger Moore's Bond films fun or entertaining is elevated to 11 in this film. This film was so silly, or at least it's considered silly, that Dolph Lundgren himself even appeared in this film briefly. I've always been able to sit through a view to a kill, and when it's over, I am never visibly angry or never look like I want to punch my TV or take some hardcore acid trip because if any of that happened, this movie would have pissed me off. But unlike other films we've already discussed on this list, it doesn't. So, does anybody else want to drop out? Minus Jason Momoa, Thunderball was the Aquaman movie of the 1960s. So much of the final act of the movie takes place underwater that in the final climactic battle, underwater of course, it is so hard to tell who is who. The costume design for both the good guys and the bad guys is literally the same and the only way you can tell where Bond is or where the villain Emilio Largo is is because of close up shots of the actors. And saying there's too much underwater action or too many scenes shot underwater is actually kind of a funny thing since that only takes up about a 10 minute section of the movie right before Bond and Largo duke it out on his yacht with some of the most memorable 1960s music playing and shots of the boat looking like it's gonna hit a jetty or hundreds of rocks and blow up and it miraculously doesn't because they needed a convincing fight between Bond and Largo. It sounds like I'm bitching a lot about Thunderball but I'm being realistic. It's nowhere near as good as Connery's first three Bond films. I think almost everyone can use universally agree and it's clear that this film Connery is starting to feel the pressure of playing Bond and is starting to get exhausted. Unfortunately the legacy of this movie isn't one that's good. It led to a lawsuit by Kevin McClory against Ian Fleming and Elon Productions that for years prohibited them from using Spectre and Ernst Avril Blofeld and related characters as characters in the series. Years and years of legal battles were finally settled in 2013 with McClory's estate and these lawsuits were what resulted in the far inferior never say never again to be made. 
the exact same movie but with a few casting changes and none of the Bond series tropes, therefore making it an unofficial entry into the Bond series. It doesn't count on my end, so it's not ending up on this list. But back to Thunderball. Its strengths lie in the fact that this continues the story set up in Connery's first two, where Bond is pitted against Spectre. This time going face to face with the number two man, number two, just kidding, Emilio Largo. It is the, also the first Bond movie in which Bond is injured in the line of duty, and I think when talking about this film or Sean Connery's portrayal of Bond in general, that is an aspect that goes overlooked. While it is a solid and entertaining entry into the Bond series compared to Connery's other Bond films aside from Diamonds Are Forever, we've already established that I hate that movie, it is nevertheless disappointing in the end, even if Bond is able to escape a tank full of sharks. One of my friends sits this one out. She's just dead. The Timothy Dalton era of Bond was unfortunately short-lived, as Dalton only did two Bond films, which were released in 1987 and 1989, and they were so different from each other. While Dalton may have lacked the charm, but still had the rugged toughness of the Bond described in Fleming's novels, I feel his two Bond films go overlooked, and honestly, his darker take on the character was something the general public, I believe, was not ready for. Everyone had been used to the camp and the wit of the Roger Moore era that it took time to adjust to Dalton, and honestly, I don't think everyone ever made that adjustment, or had enough time to make that adjustment. His Bond films seemed to exist in the shadows, but I'll let you in on a secret. He made two damn good Bond films, even if this one is middle of the pack for me. That's solely because I feel like I know this film head to toe. When it was packaged in the Ultimate Edition DVD box sets, it was in Volume 1, it was the first one in that volume, so every time I did a Bondathon, I always started with The Living Daylights. So much of this movie comes across as boring for me, but not in a bad way, if that makes sense, because I've seen it so many times and it's all so familiar. The pre-title sequence is one of my favorites in the series, the theme tune is great, the plot takes its time to reveal itself, the Aston Martin V8 Vantage is the best Bond car and don't let anyone tell you differently. And while the humor and wit of Moore's Bond may be out the window, Dalton's portrayal of Bond and the characters themselves finally feel like they're human. Kara Malovoy isn't my favorite Bond girl, but she's serviceable in the film. It's also a Bond film that you have to pay attention to, as the plot involves an old Soviet policy meaning death to spies and puts the bait-and-switch trick back again into the movies when Pushkin is set up as the villain, but it turns out Koskov is actually the villain, until he's not. This whole time, it's actually this guy Whitaker. The final showdown with Whitaker is disappointing though, and it feels like this piece of the movie is something that is tacked on, when instead it probably should have just been left on the cutting room floor. There's a lot to like about this film for sure. The henchman Necros posing as a milkman and throwing milk bottles at an MI6 safe house. Pure Bond content right there. If I hadn't seen this movie so many times and I wasn't as familiar with it as I have been in the past, it would definitely be higher up on this list. 007 here. I'll report in an hour. Won't you join me? Better make that two. This was once a Bond film I was never all that impressed with, and wrote it off as the most silly of the Connery era until I saw Diamonds Are Forever. Ugh. To say this movie isn't ludicrous or silly is definitely an understatement. It is the first Bond movie to deviate heavily or entirely from the plot of Ian Fleming's novel, using only a few characters and locations, as well as other elements from the story. As the years have gone on though, I have grown to have a lot of fun with You Only Live Twice. Of course, there's things about the movie I don't like. Yeah, not a huge fan of Donald Pleasance's interpretation of Blofeld, which sucks because I love Donald Pleasance, but I also love how after four films, we are finally introduced to Ernst Avro Blofeld, who becomes Bond's arch nemesis, even in the recent years. The plot is outlandish, and when Bond is turned into a Japanese man by a Kiko... Is that Bond or is that Spock from Star Trek? 
The action scene with Little Nelly is one of my favorite action scenes in the Connery era and one of my favorite action scenes in a Bond film. And speaking of the action, You Only Live Twice is the most action-packed Bond film of the Connery Bond films, let alone the 1960s Bond films. I like Bond's allies in this film a lot. Tiger Tanaka is a standout. The action is brutal and is just a fun Bond movie. I don't have that much more to say about it other than it's an entertaining ride, though Connery does look bothered and tired in the role at this point. Tiger said, from now on, you must do everything in Japanese style. Everything? The man with the golden gun. The man with the golden gun will forever be cemented with some of the worst reviews a Bond film has ever received. A lot of people don't like this movie. One question. Why? This movie is damn entertaining. You have the best villain henchman dynamic the series has ever seen with Nick Knack and Scaramanga. You have the late, great Christopher Lee as Scaramanga, who is a formidable foe for Bond. Sheriff J.W. Pepper makes a grand return. Bond ends up at a karate school. There's a flying car, a giant space weapon on an island, and a cat and mouse game between Bond and Scaramanga. How is that not a recipe for success? It's sad this is considered a low point for the Bond series. It's one of my James Bond comfort movies, you know? It's not the best of the Roger Moore era, but it's by far my favorite of the Roger Moore era. It's the most fun I've seen Roger Moore have in any of his Bond films. The character of Mary Goodnight is annoying as shit. Sure, and is written as the stereotypical dumb ditzy blonde, but in all its cheesiness, in all its over-the-topness, it never goes too far into absurdity, unlike Moonraker, and is able to fully realize how this movie is a product of its time. Christopher Lee. Fucking legend. To us, Mr. Bond, we are the best. License to Kill is by far the most non-Bond Bond film ever released. Other than Q's larger role in this film, and rightfully larger role, anything involving Desmond Llewellyn is amazing, there is not a lot in here that would have you believe you were watching a Bond film. This is a straightforward revenge flick, with Bond seeking revenge for the near death of his CIA pal Felix Leiter by going after drug lord Franz Sanchez, played magnificently by Robert Davi. I'm off the Sanchez. This is like if an episode of Miami Vice and Lethal Weapon did a crossover with the Bond franchise. This is also the most violent Bond film to date in my opinion. Legs get bitten off by sharks, body parts get torn up in a shredder, heads explode inside a pressure chamber. There's even implied rape in this film. Yeah, this movie goes there. The Timothy Dalton Bond films are recognized for their dark portrayal of the iconic super spy, and compared to The Living Daylights, at the time of release I'm not sure audiences were receptive to how dark Dalton's portrayal of the character was, let alone how dark this movie was. When this film first went through the ratings board, it was rated R and was then re-edited to gain a PG-13 rating, a first for the Bond series. But just imagine if this had been the first and only R-rated Bond film. It certainly feels like that, and this is so different from the other films in the series that it never outstays its welcome and feels fresh and original for the series, especially since for most of the movie Bond has gone rogue and M has revoked his license to kill. And how dare this movie kill awesome characters like Sharky! Compliments of Sharky! I want you to know this is nothing personal. It's purely business. Ah, the Daniel Craig Bond movie that is regarded as one of the most listless and boring in the franchise, even more boring than Quantum of Solace. I mean, come on guys, you think this is worse than Quantum? Spectre at least has a plot, something that can't be said about Quantum. This movie is also better than Quantum alone because of its editing. 
Sure, this movie has some major problems. The script is a bit weak, the musical score is recycled from Skyfall, and the action sequences are a bit tepid. But honestly, Bond's investigation into uncovering the secrets of Spectre and who Spectre is are really interesting. And trust me guys, Bond and Blofeld being foster brothers isn't the dumbest thing this series has ever done. It's honestly the least of my worries with this movie. That twist is so blown out of proportion to the point where complaints about it have gotten borderline annoying. Anyone who says that Craig seems to be out of it, and other than a few scenes, I don't buy that argument either. Other complaints lodged against this film claim the film feels too much like a classic era Bond film. Uh, did you guys not watch the end of Skyfall where we actually got back to that classic era? As stated, this movie does have its problems, but the fact everyone acts like this is the worst Bond film or one of the worst is insanity to me. We still have a deeply emotional story for Bond that follows on from plot threads from the last three movies that eventually get tied up in No Time to Die, and this is really a classic Bond adventure for the modern era of Bond. The pre-title sequence is a standout. The MI6 Brigade gets a lot more to do. It's still a well-made movie and has some of the best scenes in a Bond film in the franchise's history. The reintroduction to Spectre in the first scene of Spectre is an all-time highlight of the series. This is the one Bond film where I hold bitterness towards fans who don't like it, or at least fans who think it's worse than Quantum. The production itself is more well-rounded than Quantum's, and I would watch this any day of the week over a lot of other films ranked lower on this list. Despite tepid action sequences, which were directly related to an injury Daniel Craig sustained on set, this is still a fun Bond movie to watch, and it does not get any of the respect it deserves. Not one single Bond fan who doesn't like this movie can find a single positive about this movie and that's a damn shame because there are so many positives that outweigh the negatives. This movie also has Dave Bautista as Hinks and that itself is a highlight. Seriously, give Spectre another watch now that no time to die is out and I guarantee you in the grand scheme of things regarding Craig's Bond, this movie won't look so bad in hindsight. No time to die? was so good, it improved Spectre. How about that? Here you are, sir. One prolytic digestive enzyme shake. Do me a favor, will you? Throw that down the toilet. Cut out the middle, man. I understand many of the problems surrounding the casting in the world is not enough. You all know who I'm talking about. The action scenes get a little backloaded in the second half, effectively making this feel more like Tomorrow Never Dies. But one of the things I love about the world is not enough is the endless debate as to who the main villain of the movie actually is. Is it Renard or is it Elektra? After slightly over 20 years after its release, I don't think this debate is ever going to be resolved, and for the longest time I was in the camp of Elektra, being the brains behind the operation while Renard was her puppet. In recent years though, after I've rewatched the movie multiple times, I honestly feel differently, and that's the beauty of the world is not enough, along with the fact that it's really one of the only Bond films in which there are two main villains. The way I look at it now is that Renard is actually the main villain of the movie, having kidnapped Elektra and causing her to develop Stockholm Syndrome. Was this Renard's plan all along as a means to get her to cause a nuclear meltdown in Istanbul? This could be a bit of a reach, especially since Elektra killed her father as revenge for leaving her as bait and not paying the ransom money, but at the same time, it is a plausible explanation. The complexity of the debate and the complexity of the plot, which attempted to honor the Bond movies of the past by bringing the plot back to a nuclear meltdown, instead of hammering the idea of the year 2000 and how technology will fail when the calendar hits that year and make this a way more exhilarating and exciting film compared to Tomorrow Never Dies and has more memorable action sequences than said film. The pre-title sequence alone might be just the best the series has to offer. With a thrilling and unique boat chase along the Thames River, one of the few action scenes in the series to take place in London. This and Goldeneye were always favorites of mine as a kid, so there may be a bit of sentimentality towards this movie in that regard, but it never bores me when I watch it, and Pierce Brosnan is still electric as Bond, and is also able to tap into a darker, 
meaner side of the character we haven't seen him portraying his run as Bond. Besides, what's the point of living if you can't feel alive? There's no point in living if you can't feel alive. Then maybe you shouldn't be living here! Ah, the one that started it all. This was our introduction to James Bond. Definitely not mine though, since this came out in 1962 and I didn't even exist, but Dr. No paved the way for many of the series tropes that would come in many of the other installments in the following years. If it weren't for this film, we wouldn't have the iconic gun barrel sequence that starts all but three James Bond films, we wouldn't have Bond's signature catchphrase, and we would not have Sean Connery in what is his most iconic role. The story is actually really compelling, and considering how low of a budget this film was made on and how much money it made proved how a series like this could flourish. Obviously, back then, there was probably no telling how long the Bond series was going to last, let alone 60 years. But without this film, we wouldn't be talking about another 59 years and 24 movies that have become integral to cinema history. While the film doesn't include all of the Bondisms that the series is known for, it does have its iconic moments, such as the Ursula Andres bikini scene, her playing the first Bond girl ever in Honey Rider, the tarantula scene, the famous introduction of Bond, the introduction of Felix Leiter, Bond getting his signature Walter PPK, the introduction of Dr. No, and the fact he's only in a third of the movie and the movie is named after him, Miss Taro! We hear a little bit about this world, how Dr. No is affiliated with Spectre, and it just makes this movie feel larger in scale than we think. It's not the best Bond film, but it's so influential in the direction the series ends up taking. I've never seen it listed as anyone's favorite Bond film, and I can see why, but I've never seen it in the middle or at the bottom of anyone's list as well. It's always been near the top. I'm a member of Spectre. Spectre? Spectre. Special executive for counterintelligence, terrorism, revenge, extortion. The four great cornerstones of power, Headed by the greatest brains in the world. From Russia with Love is considered by many to be the quintessential Bond film. Yes, it's an all-time classic, but for me it's not the best. Fans and critics say that Dr. No is the slowest Bond film of them all, but for me, I think that belongs to From Russia With Love. The only difference is that the world here is expanded upon, and the story is a lot more interesting than it is in Dr. No. This, in a way, feels like a direct sequel to Dr. No, even though it's really not, and it really shows what these films can be if they embrace serialized storytelling rather than the anthology-like format that most of these movies take on. More of the Bond tropes become more prevalent in this film, especially the blonde-haired henchman and Red Grant. Rosa Klebb as the main villain is perfection, and Connery is once again great. This film is so iconic that, like another classic Bond film, it got a video game adaptation. As stated, the world is expanded here. We learn more about Spectre, that was only briefly mentioned in Dr. No and how Spectre operates, and we see more of Bond with Q Branch and Desmond Llewellyn's first appearance as Q. I can see why From Russia With Love is the favorite Bond film of many cr fans and critics, but its slow pace brings it down for me. Still, it, it definitely is a classic Bond film, and one that delivers a really fun adventure to follow. While many of Roger Moore's Bond films played into his personality and dialed up the camp, The Spy Who Loved Me is surprisingly reserved. This is Moore's most serious Bond film, even if it does have its moments of silliness. But those small, fleeting moments of silliness feel earned as this adventure feels a bit more personal for Bond, and this movie has a unique idea of making this film more personal for the Bond girl, Anya Amasova, aka Triple X. Not that Triple X. Ugh. She is only partaking in this mission to get revenge on Bond because Bond killed her lover. While the villain Stromberg might be a slight disappointment, the henchman Jaws in his first appearance is a menacing, threatening presence that isn't to be reckoned with. The scenes in Egypt are hauntingly creepy, yet thrillingly exciting at the same time. 
The Spy Who Loved Me was even nominated for three Academy Awards. The pre-title sequence is a wonder to behold, and Nobody Does It Better remains one of the series' best title songs. While it received mixed reviews at the time of release, reflective reviews have been much more positive, and The Spy Who Loved Me is now regarded as an all-time Bond classic. It is also the movie that put Barbara Brock, aka Mrs. Ringo Starr, on the map, and made her Bond girl so memorable that she stands up there with the Vespers and Natalias of the series. This movie was proof that in the spy genre, NOBODY DOES IT BETTER THAN JAMES BONDS! What a helpful chap. These top five Bond films are perfect damn movies or damn near perfect movies and Goldeneye is a goddamn fantastic incredible film. The most important Bond film ever made, Goldeneye also has another place in history that cements its legacy. The video game adaptation of the same name. Goldeneye probably wouldn't have made as much of a name for itself as it did if that amazing game did not exist and allowed people to discover the incredible movie it was based on. But GoldenEye just didn't impact the video game market. It also impacted the 007 series moving forward. Many critics and journalists were against the idea of releasing more Bond films in a new modern era. Many critics didn't think the series would last into the 1990s or beyond, and that's because the world had drastically changed. The Cold War had ended, the Berlin Wall had fallen down, and the Soviet Union had mostly dissolved. GoldenEye made the smart move of beginning its story in 1986. Then, after the great title sequence that provided a lot of symbolism to such events, and a great song by the immortal Tina Turner, the story flashes forward to 1995, the year of the movie's release. GoldenEye really stunned critics and was met with universal acclaim, and is, rightfully so, regarded as one of the best of the series, and in my opinion, one of the best movies ever made. Trevelyan might be the best villain the series has had to date, with his only competition coming from Le Chief in Casino Royale. The story is so involving and engaging, and is a lot more personal to Bond than one might expect. The movie really attributes the past 007 films by acting as more of an action thriller rather than a straightforward action movie. But when the action happens, the action is thrilling. The archive shootout and the tank chase through Russia stand out as amongst the best action sequences of the series. GoldenEye also has the best henchmen, best characters, and remains the most quotable Bond film to date. Yelena, take a hike! Not to mention, it was directed by Martin Campbell, who successfully launched Pierce Brosnan as Bond, and would go on to do the same with Daniel Craig in Casino Royale. Not a single person I have talked to hates this movie or thinks it's only okay. It's an iconic movie from not only the 90s, but childhood. Everyone knows it, and everyone loves it. You can't win. Goldfinger! Goldfinger really set the standard for what we should expect from the future of the series and is the best Bond film of Sean Connery's run, and by many is considered the quintessential and the best Bond film ever made. While the film is relatively short at 110 minutes, so much happens in Goldfinger and it moves at such a brisk pace that it always feels shorter than its actual runtime. Goldfinger is so eccentric it's always a joy and thrill anytime Goldfinger is on screen and explaining his Operation Grand Slam plan to everyone. Watching a film from 1964 today that still manages to hold up fairly well is a true testament to the time and how well made the film actually is. There's a lot of practical effects used in Goldfinger, something the series is known for. Next time, die another day, get it correct! <laughs> the iconic, you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die! line appears in the film and the visual effects of that laser coming from Bond's crotch is still amazing to this day. And we can't forget about Oddjob. 
the silent assassin who throws his hat and the hat kills you instantly if you are hit, as poor Tilly Masterson found out and decapitates the statue, which is just statue abuse. The opening title sequence started to trend to beginning the movie with a totally unrelated sequence that is separate from the rest of the movie, off-color and tongue-in-cheek humor, especially when it comes to the main Bond girl's name, and features more foreign locales, a trend that always makes watching a Bond film a visual treat. To say Goldfinger isn't a classic is, quite frankly, a disgrace. It's by far the best Connery film and the most recognizable and iconic Bond film from the 1960s. Do you expect me to talk? installment in the series, the 25th film, and the fifth and final one to star Daniel Craig as the iconic British spy, is currently taking the world by storm, and could prove to be divisive amongst fans of the series. There have been lots of polarizing reactions to this one, and I mean LOTS. No Time to Die is essentially the last Jedi of the 007 series. This movie is bold, daring, and takes an enormous amount of risks that many of which thought they may take but weren't 100% sure that they would take, and they took them. It's fair to say that Kerry Joji Fukunaga did for the Bond series what Ryan Johnson did for Star Wars, create a movie that didn't intentionally subvert expectations, but rather challenged audiences rather than catering to them. It's crazy how a Bond film of all movies could have so much to unpack afterwards, but this is the one that will be talked about for a long time, no matter if you love it or hate it. Even I needed a couple more viewings of this movie after my initial screening to fully digest what I had witnessed. No Time to Die took big, enormous risks that the Bond series hasn't taken before, and I think they all paid off. Hans Zimmer delivers one of his best scores yet, while the focus is more on Bond's psychological and emotional states, substituting genuine emotion over spectacle, but when the spectacular action scenes occur, it is heavy, mean, brutal, and gritty. It has one of my favorite action set pieces in a Craig Bond film yet. This wraps up Craig's five film arc in one of the most satisfying ways I've seen an interconnected story wrap up. Rami Malek's villain Safin is a haunting, chilling villain and someone who believes he may be the hero without realizing he's a villain. Someone stuck with a god complex, and I love that about his villain. Even if he's not in the movie all that much, it may be a bit underwhelming for some. His presence is still felt throughout a good majority of the movie. While Shauna Lynch and Ana de Armas kick ass, with many fans dying to see more of de Armas' character Paloma. Lots of callbacks to previous Bond films as, as well, especially within the title sequence itself feeding off a pre-title sequence for the ages. The fan service never feels forced and never gets in the way of story or Bond's journey. It all feels earned. I could not have asked for a better swan song for Daniel Craig's Bond. The ending will probably be make or break for many fans of the series, but the way it was handled was done in a beautifully written way. What a finale. What a movie. Thank you, Daniel Craig, for 15 years and five movies of Bond. Your legacy as Bond will be a tough one to beat. Walking into the theater for the next Bond film and not seeing Daniel Craig as Bond is going to be one strange feeling. We both eradicate people to make the world a better place. I just want to be a little tidier. Trying to pick my top two Bond films is a hard choice. Obviously, there's only two left, but where to place them is the challenge. And no matter where I put these two, there's gonna automatically be debate. Especially if I put one in one place, the one many consider to be best in the series, but then the number one is also considered to be the best. I always go back and forth between these two for the top two spots, but I think I finally settled on the placing of these two. So, without further ado, and with fans probably punching thin air after this, yeah. 
this not making the top slot is gonna ruffle some feathers for sure but let me say this this and my number one choice just like my top five are legit perfect movies what it came down to for me was the filmmaking aspects casino royale reinvented bond for a new generation while staying true to ian fleming's original vision of bond as described throughout his novels we are stripped away of many of the tropes of the, the series had followed for so many years and instead this reboot focused on bond's early days in mi6 essentially being an origin story as to how he got his double o status and license to kill casino royale plays as a perfect three-act structure an origin story, a story about the mission, and finally, a tragic love story between Bond and Vesper Lind, who stakes Bond the money for the Casino Royale in Montenegro to bank Le Chief, a banker for the world's terrorists. The movie's action scenes are top-notch, and the parkour chase through the construction site at the beginning of the film is not only a standout Bond action sequence, but one of the best action sequences ever captured on film. This sequence is the standard that all modern day action films should be held to, featuring death defying stunts, beautiful cinematography, and small little moments that enhance the sequence, making it more human and in the moment. And the romance between Bond and Vesper is perfectly laid out before our eyes. I'm not sure there's a better romance portrayed in a big budget blockbuster to date. Every moment Bond and Vesper spend together shows just how much closer they get to the point where Bond says, there's no more armor left, you've stripped it all away from me, and even going as far as to resigning from MI6, a trend far too common in these Daniel Craig Bond movies, but somehow still very well done. All of the other action sequences rank amongst Bond's best, and the script manages to keep your interest as the poker game Bond plays against Le Chiffre ratchets up even more tension, leading to some very intense moments involving Bond as well. This movie, along with Daniel Craig's portrayal of Bond, reinvented both the character and the franchise, and Casino Royale deals a massive winning hand. And kudos to Craig for proving us all wrong, when we all thought he would suck. Yes. Considerably. And, the number one pick for the best Bond film, in my opinion, is... Yes, yes, I know, this is most likely considered a controversial choice, even if it is considered one of the strongest films in the series, and both this and Casino Royale are considered perfect movies to me. What gives Skyfall the slight edge over Casino Royale in this ranking for me, though, is a couple of things. One, I feel as if in terms of the filmmaking, Skyfall is a better made movie. From the performances, Roger Deakins' lush cinematography, the editing, production design, costume design, his writing being top-notch, just like Casino Royale, and Sam Mendes' directing, this feels like a slightly more balanced movie in all of those regards. And two, this is a more personal adventure for Bond, which is something I've gravitated a lot towards in the Daniel Craig era, and a huge reason why No Time to Die is so high up on the list. This movie, like No Time to Die after it, is emotionally satisfying, and it seems fitting that Skyfall became the first Bond film to gross 1 billion worldwide on the franchise's 50th anniversary. Speaking of this being an anniversary film, unlike <laughs> Die Another Day, <coughs> which relied heavily on nostalgia and thought shoving every reference to the previous 19 films in the series it could down our throats, Skyfall takes a more reserved and subtle approach to its references. None of the references ever feel forced and feel like they are naturally woven in. Couple this with more screen time for Judi Dench's M and the eccentric performance from Javier Bardem and his hair as the villain Silva, the film manages to satisfy on more ways than one. Taking into account that Silva himself isn't even introduced into the film until halfway through, Silva's monologue about rats and being the last rat standing with Bond really sums up his maniacal nature. And even when he isn't in the film, the screenplay is so well written that it does a good job of fleshing him out as a character when he's off screen and operating in the shadows, and his motivation is crystal clear. There have been complaints in the near decade since the movie came out that his plan is too big for something so simple, but honestly, that's the point. So many say that if his plan is ultimately to kill him, why doesn't he just go up to her house and shoot her? There's more to it than that. People really disregard the entire humiliation he's attempting to enforce on her, which in turn leads to her being discredited for many in the British government, including Voldemort, Ray Fiennes himself, Gareth Mallory. 
this movie has so many unexpected layers like that that the movie's simple approach makes for a more complicated complex and layered villain and story the film celebrated bond's 50th in style and i have never been happier walking out of a bond film in my life this was so well done with one of the most memorable pre-title sequences in, in the history of the series and a great title song performed by adele much more character work here as opposed to action but that's not a bad thing while the action is more small scale this movie called for it after how loud and obnoxious quantum of solace was and the rebooted timeline established so many things like money penny and q just an all-around great bond film well there you go bond lovers an hour to rank all 25 bond films and feel free to argue with me in the comments and tell me why you think one film shouldn't be in the spot that it is or why one film should be i i, I don't know i get what, whatever you want to do in the comments feel free to argue but <laughs> no please keep it civil in the comments we all have our own opinions i love james bond and it's it's one of my favorite it's my favorite series of all time so ranking this took a lot of thought a lot of time and a lot of effort so please appreciate the hard work that i put into this video uh if you like this video please like and comment and subscribe at the end of this video my name is alex madden i'll see you at the movies somewhere